Hey everybody, how are we doing? Good. Good. Hi guys. All right, all right. Mic check. Check, check. This is our first meeting for the Creative Collective in 2019. So excited to be yeah, here. Yeah, let's clap that up. Yes. <laughs> so my name's Imani. I'm the founder of the Creative Collective. We are so excited to be here with Squarespace. We are doing a new series with them. What are you working on? This is the first part of a four-part series. Where we're really getting creatives, tangible advice to get your ideas off the ground, right? Because all over Instagram, it's like, just start, 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 start. And it's like, <laughs> what, like, okay, but like, can you actually help me start? So it's really exciting to be here, um, especially because Squarespace empowers creatives to really get their ideas off the ground. And when I think of getting ideas off the ground, I think of John Henry. <laughs> I think of John Henry, a serial entrepreneur, first business at 18, sold it two years later for a million dollars, um, but I think more admirably is really transparent with the journey, right? Not just kind of like, I had an idea and now here we are. Um, so before we get started, I'd love to have you kind of say some words, introduce yourself, and we'll dive into the questions. Sure, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> those very kind words. What up, CCNY? Oh, man. Um, I've been excited to work with you for a little while. Um, we shared the stage one time. We shared, we were on a panel together with Barry O'Brien, my business partner at Harlem Capital, at Samsung 837. Um, and that was my first time formally meeting you, but I had already known about all the things that you guys were doing. And Imani has an exceptional ability to mobilize people, to mobilize people and get them in the spirit of the mission. And that's really the only way that you're able to grow as quickly as you have in the time that you have. So big shout out to the CCNY team um, and yeah, you and all of your comrades. Um, so yeah, let's do it. H how many of you guys have um, any bit of context on uh, what I'm doing and who I am a little bit? Awesome, wow, thank you guys all so much. That means a lot. Cool, so I can spare kind of the background story. A lot of that is, is well documented and keynotes and stuff like that. You can check it out on YouTube. Um, hey, Destiny. Um, but to, just to give a, a bit of formal context, the most important thing about my journey coming up really is coming from an immigrant family. My parents immigrated from the Dominican Republic and that shaped everything in my upbringing because we grew up really, really broke. We grew up below the poverty line, which means like both my parents combined didn't make $30,000. We grew up in Washington Heights um, and my mom you know, we, there was four of us. I'm the youngest of four, so she did what she could to kind of help out around the house. My dad was a presser in a sweatshop making 40 cents per garment in 100 plus degree New York City summers. And he drove taxis and he did really a bunch of stuff to help us through. And those were the earliest kind of, that's the formative DNA that I had coming up. Um, and as some of you know, um, out of high school, I was working a job as a doorman, and that changed so much for me because I'm a really big believer that the way that you can, the way that you approach any opportunity, is what determines what opportunities you get. Right? There were doormen there, and doormen from the beginning of time in New York City, and how many of them there didn't realize that the currency was the real people that was walking in and out. And so you can either sit there and be apathetic. I don't like dealing with apathetic people personally. Like apathetic, someone's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm okay today. Like I like people who are activated in the spirit of something. It doesn't matter to me what you do. I just like when someone is that way. When they're like, hey, how can I be a service? How can I help? Man, I want to do something. Not someone that when you ask them for something, they're like, well, how much are you going to pay me right, right away? Like, and I get that. That's a challenge at creative space, and we'll get into that. But there's a difference between like commanding your value in the marketplace and just being willing to do shit and just like you know roll your sleeves up and get going so anyway that was the kind of um, person that I um, have always been and that led me to start my first company which I as Imani mentioned was fortunate to build 
um, and was or fortunate to flip it. And one of the things I want to get into, by the way, is like selling a business really is nothing. Like I'd have m way more cash now if I would have held on to the business. I sold that shit because I didn't want to do that shit anymore. <laughs> like I didn't want to clean people's dirty underwear. It's a very high touch business. You know, I have film clients. I have the Wolf of Wall Street, Law and Order, Boardwalk Empire. Any given moment, calling me, banging on my door. Oh, wait, you're scooping, you're scooping my question. Oh, gotcha. Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap on this then for that first question. Um, so many, when, the further I went along and I learned enough to know that this is not what I wanted to do for life, you had to have the self-awareness to step back and pivot into a new, well, pivot is a word that you hear a lot. It's more like step back, take the learnings, and evolve. Um, and for me, I had the opportunity, I was just fortunate to have the opportunity to flip it into some cash, but even if you don't have the opportunity, the most important thing is to take what you learn and evolve. So anyway, now uh, I'm a partner at Harlem Capital. It's a $25 million seed stage fund. We invest in women and founders of color. Uh, we're on a mission to change the face of entrepreneurship, baby. Uh, so it starts in this room. Um, so that's a little bit of context. Yes, let's give that for John Henry. Let's Thank you. So I feel like we're constantly being bombarded with this sensationalized idea of what it means to be an entrepreneur, right? Yep. Like we see one day you're homeless and you think of an app and then the next day you're a millionaire <laughs> and on the cover of Forbes and you did it all by yourself and no one helped you and yeah. okay. I love your idea of entrepreneurship, though. You say it's an ordinary idea by an ordinary person that has the bravery to act on something they see in their mind, but it doesn't exist. So can you just talk to us about those ordinary people who have ordinary ideas? Yep. I mean, you're looking at an ordinary guy right this moment in front of you. Um, and that is a, a subject that I like to take on precisely because it's packaged uh, you know, this entrepreneurial journey is packaged in such a way. Remember what I said earlier, it's like as I've gone on, I learn I, and I absorb. Well, as you learn, you're able to have a more nuanced perspective of something. And then I realized, oh man, the reason it's packaged up the way it is is because a lot of industries profit off of packaging it up that way. And I don't mean necessarily in a in a can of, it doesn't come at the expense of you per se, but it's just that a lot of machines, um, they capitalize on traffic and media w works that way. And, and I think media is gonna be substantially disrupted um, because as of right now, the way that media monetizes, as you know, is traffic. And in the search for traffic, this insatiable appetite to get traffic, and, and that has changed from radio to TV to now digital to now micro content and it's just getting snippier and snippier and wilder or what have you. And there lies a temptation to sensationalize things, to draw traffic. And I can recall as an entrepreneur coming up, you know, by the way, my first business was ugly as fuck. Like, meaning when you lifted the hood, it was ugly. Like, you know, my books weren't clean. You know, I was still like, paying for shit from the money, you know, like taking from my own personal cash and putting it in the business, and then also doing the same thing, the owner's draws and, you know, all kinds of things. I was sued, I sued back, I hired, I fired, I've been in car accidents, I've been through a lot of stuff in that first business. And, and the way that it gets written about frustrates me, so I'm glad that you asked me because it wasn't as pretty as, as it's made to seem. And, and to the heart of your question, like what is entrepreneurship, is not necessarily about emerging on the end with a pretty thing. I think the art is the ugliness, and it's always there, and you just embrace it in a different way, and then you start to see a little bit of nuance in the, in the ugliness, so to speak. So, you know, I do firmly believe that it's the individual um, that chips away at it little by little, and that, my friends, is the major difference. So many people, precisely because of the perception that's created, feel unequipped. Ah, it takes a business boy wonder, it takes a girl genius, and they don't even start. Uh -huh. Because they're so discouraged by the perception that's been enforced. And it's the people that say, I could do this too. And they chip, and they chip, and they chip. My first chip was a little business card that said John Henry Cleaners. 
with a logo that I found out later looked exactly like the Russian communist logo. <laughs> Literally. That was my first chip. My second chip, a suit that didn't fit me. My third chip, going to Harlem doorman and saying, hey, my name's Sean Henry, and, and stammering and, and making a fool of myself and doing it over and over and over until I got better. And then I got them. I developed the ability to persuade and get someone to do something on my behalf solely because they liked me. And it grew and it grew and it grew. And it's grown from that business to then an incubator that grew and then, and then I shut down. And, and it's grown in various forms, but if there's anything to take away, it's, it's the person who's got the bravery to chip at it. And that's one thing I really, really love. Because so you, you're born and raised in Harlem. You go to Florida for a little bit for high school, but then you come back. Yeah. And you're a doorman in a building. Mm -hmm. And you talk about this elevator moment, right? This moment that changed your life. Can you tell us about that elevator moment? What is an elevator moment? How could you be ready for it? And what was yours? Yeah, this whole concept came from a mentor to me. It was an Italian guy who had no reason to be helping me because I was just really scrappy. And I sat with him and I knew he was rich and he lived on 55th and Fitz. And so I was like, hey, look. <clears throat> He's like, what's your spiel? I was like, all right, um, if you convince your neighbors to sign up with my dry cleaner, then I'll give you 20% of what they make. He's like, oh, this kid's a disaster. He's like, I'm going to show you. He's got this heavy Italian accent. I'm going to show you innovation, strategy, this and that. And he's showing me all these things. And if you have the right seed and you pair it with just a gentle push, you'd be surprised what can grow from that seed. And he taught me, he said, John, I believe in elevator moments. And he goes, you're a driven person. So you're going to be going up the stairs anyway. You're going to make it up to the fucking top, going up the steps. But every once in a while, when you look, if the elevator's open, if you can make that elevator, then you'll go up 10 flights. And then you got to get off and go start going back up the steps again. But there is legitimately these moments that if you seize them, can make a monumental impact on your trajectory. Now, here's the thing. You don't always make them. And, and I think the misconception is that they're once in a lifetime. I don't think they are. I don't think they're that common. They're not as frequent as like, you know, everyday occurrences, which is what makes them elevator moments. But I do think that they come, you know, maybe two, three times a year if you're ready. Sometimes more. It depends on how you can position yourself for them. And so anyway, as an example, my first elevator moment was when this one resident in the building was like, John, what are you going to go and do? Because I told him I was going to start a dry cleaner. He was in disbelief. And he said, dude, I've been working in film and TV the past 25 years. No one wants to do our clothes because we shoot at 3 in the morning. What time you get off? 11 p.m., I told him. He picked me up that day and brought me onto the set of what became my first film account, The Wolf of Wall Street. And I was stammering, and I didn't nail it perfectly, but I was fortunate. A couple months later, he called me back, and that was the elevator moment. So these moments, they come and go. The question is, can you be ready for them? And that's a question that only you can answer. And guess what? You can fake being ready on Instagram. You can't fucking fake that shit in the moment. You can't fake it. You won't make it. And when you miss those moments, when you miss those moments, that's when you have to be honest with yourself and reflect on it and say, all right, I'm going to get better for the next one. I'll share a time, an example of a time when I missed one. Just recently, a person will go unnamed, very prominent black family, one of the few real wealthy black dynasty families that we have in the country. I sat down with one of, the, one of this family member. I sat down with her, and we had lunch. And Harlem Capital, we're raising a fund, right? So we have to convince people to give us their capital so we can invest in you guys, pretty much. And um, I made the mistake of thinking, because it was, not under the, it was not a formal pitch, and I didn't have my shit tight at that time. And what a casual lunch turned into her gently prodding to see what was there. And I was slipping, man. I didn't have my numbers tight. I just didn't have it tight. And at the end, she's like, you know what? You're a really inspiring guy. Like, I tell you're super confident. You know, and she's like, let's stay in touch. And I knew that I missed the moment. I knew that I missed a moment, and you don't, there's not that many of those families. Mm -hmm. So that's one I had to take on the chin, get better. The next deal I closed. There we go. And I mean, 
you are now, I mean, let's go back to this mobile dry cleaning business because I love this story. At one point in time. I mean, it looks like hip hop, right? Hip hop to me growing up was like the scriptures, man. Like every MC imparted on you something a little different. And Hove has a line that says, there's much bigger issues in the world I know, but first I gotta take care of the world I know. That's fucking it in a nutshell. Your first business, version 1.0, you don't have to assume the pressure of you know, creating clean drinking water for the continent of Africa. It's a wonderful mission. I'm working towards it. I'm gonna be able to contribute hopefully in the near future. And by the way, if that's what really moves you, then go for it. But for some reason, like society 2.0 or whatever likes to impose this pressure of like, yo, you need to be, you know, doing good. Like you need to, meaning like you got to do some shit that's going to change the world. Not really. You got to change your world first. And I tell you, when I was cleaning people's dirty underwear, I was not changing the world. <laughs> I was not. I was helping prissy actors and actresses and whatever. But I told you what, when I sold that business, that changed my life. And not because, like, the bread I blew, and we can talk about that. That's another lesson I learned, right? But what I learned, what the real currency of that exit was, was my confidence. I was like, oh, I did this. I could do anything. And then I, get in way, I got in way over my head right after that. But at least I had the confidence to go and do something where I felt way over my head, you know? You're going to be the host of Vice Man's new show, Hustle. Congratulations. Thank you. February 10th. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, oh, shit. Know, it's so good. It's stressful, but it's really good. <laughs> I was so stressed. And he's like, you're going to lose all your money. And he looks at the camera and he's like, growing pains. <laughs> but let's talk about that. What is the most common mistake you see entrepreneurs making? Um, I... That question is such an oversimplified question for how the world exists at large, really. Um, um, but if I were to take an, a stab at like addressing it, I would say we talked about it. It's like you don't got to be, you know, you are enough exactly how you are right now to get started. And the most perplexing thing as I've gone on, actually, right? I'll talk about the most surprising thing I've learned. Now, I'm eight years into this. You know, I decided, hey, I'm, not, I'm gonna put my life into my own hands. And there's been many days where I struggled, didn't have shit to eat with, had people to pay, couldn't pay them, couldn't pay me. But I still count my blessings, even on those days. I have great pride in my ability to be thankful, especially when it's hardest. Especially when it's hardest. But now, as I've gone on, now, given the nature of the work that I'm doing, I'm deploying capital. Now I have fiduciary responsibilities and we have investors you know, whose money we manage and we're not, you know, we're, we're talking millions of dollars. Um, and the most interesting thing I've learned is like, hmm, there's a lot of people who took a, a very similar life path to get to this stage. There's a lot of people who went to very similar, like almost mirror image same handful of schools, in same internships, handful of firms, two year banking, two year this, two years Harvard Business School or Columbia. It's like, there's a lot of people who, um, for what, whatever reason, their upbringing groomed them to want to go that route. But I started realizing, man, the real value is in someone who can make it here, who took their own path. Like the reason I'm getting crazy, wildly differentiated opportunities right now is because I did it wildly different. They're not asking no banker to be on Viceland. No one gives a fuck. <laughs> they just don't. Like they're asking people who consistently made their own way and did it in their own way. So all of a sudden, it's like a garment, right? Like if you buy some shit at Zara and you show up at a party, there's gonna be 10 people wearing it. If you get it custom, you never run that risk. And so my perspective right now is custom, right? And when it's custom, and you can pair that with a good business sense, when a, when a company or firm or whatever comes up and says, hey, look, I got, you know, I got 25 on it, I want you to participate. I said, you know, I'm holding out for 50. Oh, we could do 35, I'm holding out for 50. 
We'll meet you at 45. I'm holding out for 50. You know? Like, you, you want to talk about hip hop? Hip, you know, Hove, he's like, um, he's like, I ran through that buck 50 live nation front of me. We have a new deal. They're talking 250. He's like, I'm holding out for three. 275, I just might agree. I'm learning all this shit from the greats before us, but we got to take it and apply it in our own way, man. I'm not interested in doing it any other way than mine. Thank you. Look, I, I don't know. I've seen enough. I've seen enough to know that there are so many ways to win. So many ways to win. And that's the thing is like the nature of these things is like you're, you're coming here because hopefully I have some perspective that I think you guys can gain from, um, but don't ever make the mistake of thinking that that's the only way, or that that's the way, or that that's the way for you, right? It's like everyone's coming at it from their own angle, their own side, you know? And for me, to answer your question about the side hustle, my perspective was, okay, I was working full-time as a doorman and going to school full-time and doing this. One thing that won't happen is you're not gonna grow your shit if you're not taking the time to grow your shit. So we can, like, if you're lazy, you, you, stay, you stop right at the door, right? Now for those of us who, and I'm not talking Instagram work hard, I'm talking for those of you who wanna work hard for real, right? Then what, what starts to happen is a shift in allocation of time, because there's only but a fixed limited amount of time. And so I was working eight hours this, I was doing you know, X amount of hours of school, and I had the little side hustle. But I was, where attention goes, where is it, what is it, where, att where attention flows, energy goes, or some shit like that. One of those like, you know, wise sayings. Like, I started nurturing the business a little bit more. And as you nurture it, I got more customers. And I got more customers, I needed to put more time there. And so my allocation started growing. And I, I started getting squeezed for time on the other things. And so something had to go. For me, the first thing that went was school. I did drop out of college my very first semester. And I told you know, the teacher, I was like, yo, I'm out. You know, it just wasn't for me. It is for some people, it wasn't for me. The next thing that went, right? So now, this is the dilemma that a lot of us face. We have the gig, we have the full-time job, and we have the side hustle. I say, nurture your side hustle until it becomes a main hustle. So if your time is tight, take that as a blessing. Remember what I said, even when shit is the hardest for me, I'm the most thankful, it, with your current predicament, guess what? You're definitely not gonna make it if your take is just a bitch about what your current situation is. Entrepreneurs just respond to the current situation. You just respond real time, every day, all day. What I'm doing is constantly responding. Where I'm at now, even still, right, it's like, I got some wins under my belt. Shit still isn't pretty all the time. I'm still responding. So anyway, at your current stage where you're at, can you nurture the side hustle to the point where it costs you more money to stay at your job than it does to leave your job? At some point, I was like, okay, cool. I, make, uh, I was making 14 bucks an hour as a doorman. I was like, all right, cool. If I stay here, I'm making, I think it was $900 every two weeks subtract taxes, I was walking away with 700 bucks every two weeks. I closed one account and I made $3,000 in a couple days. I was like, oh, I'm taking my chances. <laughs> you guys know the deal, feast or famine. It wasn't like that every day. But once I got the taste, I knew it could in theory be like that, as long as I hustled hard. And then I had to learn about hustling smart and we'll get there. But that's the balance of the side hustle and the main hustle. Nurture it, because if you don't start by viewing where you're at now as a blessing, you definitely won't make it. Gotta view it as a blessing every step of the way. And going into Hustle's resources. You're lacking resourcefulness. There we go, let's mm -hmm. talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yep. For me, I talk shit about hustling smart. I'm not that smart of a hustler, and here's what I mean. My business partners at the firm are incredibly process oriented. I consider them very, smart hustlers. And I have at this point the self-awareness to just understand like what realistically I'm good at and what I'm not. And what I'm not, uh, my temperament is not to like create very thorough lists, um, document everything on the drive, blah, 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 blah. I've just 
I've understood that my style is pretty chaotic. I have 3,875 emails in my inbox right now. Like, I, I don't use folders. Like, I'm a little chaotic. And by the way, for those of you that are like that, don't ever believe that you have to fix that in order to win. Like, you can still win doing that. So, but my whole thing is, I just really, for me, it's speed. Speed and momentum, speed and momentum, speed and momentum, right? And uh, like I say all the time, like, I'll make three, dis three mistakes before you make a single decision. And it's not that my decisions are optimized at 100%. I might be 70, I'm right about 70% of the time, I'm wrong about 30, and I'm okay with that. Those are good odds. I, I'll go to the table with those odds. I'll go to Vegas with those odds, right? And so, hustling smart, but I'll, I'll get a little bit more micro, just, right? That was like the macro, the way I think about it. Micro, here's what I'm thinking about these days. Okay, cool, look. I firmly believe that the market right now is correcting, meaning in, you know, when the recession topped out, the government put out, the Fed Reserve put a lot of money in the ecosystem to facilitate banks to loan so people can buy shit and, and companies can fund and what have you. Right now, because the economy is growing, the Federal Reserve is pulling some of that money back, which means that the capital markets do dry up. And when the budgets do dry up, you know, things like being an influencer, like all that kind of income dries up a little bit, right? And so for me, it's like, you're either one of two places. I've been putting myself in position the last five years and I've been fortunate, you know, I have a Viceland deal, which is a major distribution deal. I sold a show into VaynerMedia and we have some funds from Harlem Capital. I'm getting ready to pounce. If you're not there, if you're not there, what I would be doing is spending all my time building brand right now. Building brand. Not necessarily optimizing for sales, because yeah, you might sell a fucking e-course, but like you're just gonna be one of a million e-course marketers in the fucking world. Remember what I talked about, optimize for narrative, not for dollars, right? We talked about being custom. So right now, if I were you guys, I would find, okay, what's the, the lane that I wanna carve for myself and go all in on growing your brand awareness in that lane? Because I'll tell you what, if you don't come up top five in conversation, you're doing it wrong. That means you're either in a category that's too broad for your weight class. That means I'm trying to go against Mike Tyson. I'm gonna get knocked the fuck out, right? That means find your weight class, find your lane, and grow your brand awareness there so that when Imani Ellis says, hey, we're gonna host an event for X, you're the first person that comes to mind. Does that make sense? So hustling smart right now in the 2019 world means building your brand because that follows you everywhere. It doesn't matter what I do. I have a little bit of a tribe, a little bit of community resonance, and some skills, and you know, a little bit of reputation that I can take with me to the next project, the next project. So that's Hustling Smart. So let's give a round of applause. So we are going to do audience questions. I will preface it by saying this is not the time to pitch John Henry, so please 